So for today's example, our research question, very generic, is there a linear relationship between the organizational structure of our independent variables and our dependent variables? And for this, we're going to use our dependent variable, which is we'll just call dv, which is a scale. And we're going to be using five separate independent variables, each of which is a scale. And they're just designated iv1, iv2, iv3, iv4, and iv5. Um, now to conduct our hierarchical linear regression, we go ahead and launch SPSS. And just as with most tests, we go to Analyze. We use the drop-down menu, we go to Regression, and then we use the sidebar menu to go to Linear. Into the dependent box at the top, we'll transfer over DV. And into the independence box, we'll transfer over IV1. And then we're going to press that little radio button that says Next. And that creates Model 1. We're going to leave the DV in the dependent box, and now we're going to transfer over IV2 into the independence box and click on the next button and that actually creates model 2. We'll repeat that same process with IV3. Click next, we get model 3 and then we do the same with IV4. Right, so now we've added, now we have four models and then our last independent variable that we're going to consider is actually IV5. We move that into the independence box and instead of clicking next since this is going to be our last model that we're going to look at, uh, we're going to go ahead and click on the statistics. Just a side note, um, in version SPSS 23 that, that I'm actually using, uh, I believe the maximum is, uh, it's either 9 or 10 independent variables. And at that point, SPSS doesn't take any more. So uh, once we click on the statistics button, we want to go ahead and check off the estimates. We want our 95% confidence interval. We want the model fit. And we want the R-squared change. And the R-squared change is really quite important for us because when it comes to hierarchical linear regression, we're, we're actually most interested is the R-squared change. Then we're going to go ahead and click on Continue and then OK. And SPSS always puts out a lot of uh, a lot of tables. Um, the first table we're going to look at is the model summary. And what we can see here is that for model one, which is on the far left hand side, it gives us our R, which is 0 0.024, and then our R squared, which is 0 0.001, and it goes across. And we can also see at the far right. Actually, I'm sorry, in the middle, we'll see the R-squared change. Now, for model one, the R-squared change goes essentially from, it measures the previous model to the current model. And the previous model was actually no coefficients whatsoever. So there was really no explanation. And so the increase is actually 0 0.01. Um, if we notice that our sig value is 0.633, and we know that the sig value actually represents the p-value, which is substantially larger than our traditional 0 0.05. So we know that model 1 is actually not statistically significant. Um, what I want to point out, though, is that the r-square in model 1 is actually a representation of how much of the variability in the data is explained by this model. And the r-square value is actually a percentage. So if we multiply that by 100%, we see that Model 1, in essence, only explains 0.1% of the variability of the data. Um, it's probably, and, and thus, so 99.9% .9 of the variability in the data of the dependent variable is explained by other factors, which somewhat explains why this particular model is not statistically significant. However, if we look at Model 2, and the R squared for Model 2 is 0.1%. 80. So model 2 as it explains 80% of the variability in the dependent variable. Um, and once again when we go across to the R squared change, it's this change between models 1 and model 2 and we can see that there's actually an 80% increase. So model 2 is a much better model than, than model 1 and we can see that the sig value is 
less than, or it's actually, SPSS is showing it as 0 .000, which is actually, it goes out to a number of digits, so it's really just less than 0 .001. Uh, model 3, if we look at it, the R square value, there's a slight increase in model 3 over model 2. And we look at the R square change, and once again, model 3, it only adds 0.1% of an ink a 0.1% a increase in the explanation of the data over model 2 and we look at our sig value at the far right at 0.297 we can see that model 3 is actually not statistically significant and you have to go back and consider that what we did is we actually just added in variables right IV1 went into model 1 then we added in IV2 so then we had all, uh, IV1 and 2 in model 2 and then we had IV1 2 and 3 in model 3 we keep adding on to them, and these are the mathematical models that come out of it. And then, of course, on, if we look at model 4, the R square is 0 0.930, so there's a there's an increase, you know, greater than 90% of the variability explained by model 4. We can look at the R square change, which is 0 0.120, so there's a 10% increase there, and then which is statistically significant. And then model 5, the R square is increases a little bit more over model 4 not a great amount but a tiny amount and then we see the, um, the R square change very little 0.1 percent and then we look at the, the sig value the sig value is that it's still statistically significant but there's not just there's not a lot of additional information gained um, in the model by adding in the fifth uh, independent variable if we move on to our coefficients table here if we look on the far left, we'll see that we have uh, model 1, which just shows we have our constant plus our first independent variable. We can look at the unstandardized coefficient, the beta, which is essentially the, the, the slope. And we can see that it says it's negative 0 0.049. And then if we go to this, the sig column, which is a p-value, we see it here at, again, it's 0.633, so that uh, beta is not statistically significant. And if we look at the confidence interval for the beta for IV1 in model 1, we see that it ranges from negative 0.248 to 0.151. So the 95% confidence interval includes the value of 0, and when the slope of a line includes the value of 0, you cannot say that the independent variable is doing any prediction because the slope of the line could be essentially flat. And so that goes back to why this is not a statistically significant predictor in Model 1. Interestingly, though, if we look at Model 2, where we have independent variables 1 and 2, we can see that in Model 2, both predictors 1 and 2 are significant. Um, we can see that the standardized coefficient for the independent variable is actually a negative 1.53 where we have the confidence interval ranges from negative 1.645 to negative 1.4 and IV2, our second independent variable, the standardized coefficient is 0.274 and the confidence interval ranges from 0.260 to 0.287 when we compare 1 and 2, based on the mathematical models, you can see that in the first model, independent variable 1 was not significant by itself, but in combination with 2, it does become significant. So it's good to remember that the models, even though you're using the same independent variable data in co different combinations, they may or may not be statistically significant. Um, I know it's kind of a, a difficult concept to wrap your to, to, to wrap your head around, but um, that is the way that it actually works. So it's important to look at each of these independently. And of course, you can look at all of these models and go all the way down to five and see that you know we've got all five independent variables that we added in uh, sequentially, and then you can see the um, unstandardized coefficients, their sig values, and their confidence intervals, and all of this data here in the coefficients table is what um, you'll use, well this and also the model summary that you'll use for the APA write-up.